Welcome back. Follow me quickly to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. As we set the stage for the message today, Genesis chapter 1, if you didn't know, is typically on page 1 of your Bibles. I'm sure most of you know the story. You know the passage that we're about to read. And it all comes back to the story of creation, of all the stuff that, that the stuff and all the systems that God formed from what? Nothing, right? God, God made all this stuff and all these systems to run the stuff, and he made it from nothing. Where God spoke and he separated the day from the night and the earth and the sky and the light from the dark. And then God made mountains and oceans and then he filled them with animals and plants. And again, God said, man, this looks good, doesn't it? I did a good job. This was good. And then best best for last, God made his people. He made humans. He made us his prize of creation. And we see it here starting in verse 26 when God says, he says, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and all the wild things on the earth and all the small animals that scurry along the ground. Pretty much everything that I had just made that I said was good, human beings in my image, they're going to take care of it. And so verse 27, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. And guys, I need you to pay attention to that. Male and female in the image of God. This isn't like we see uh, like Gandalf in the clouds, okay? And the only representation of, of God is this white bearded man, okay? Male and female in the image of God. And then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. In verse 31. Then God looked over all he had made and said once again that it was very, very good. Let's pray as we get started. God, we, we believe that you are trying to speak to us today and you are here with us and, and you want to say something special to us. So God, I just need you to open our eyes and our ears through this written word inspired by the living word. God, let your Holy Spirit help us receive the message you have for us today. It's in your name that we pray and we all say, amen. So welcome back once again. I'm glad you made it to church today. It's a great day to be at church. If you don't need to know me, my name is David and I am uh, your site pastor here at New City. I have a cold and so if I sound as nasally out there as I do in my own head, I apologize. For the podcast, we will uh, apply the denasal feature to all of the audio. I'm kidding, that doesn't exist, but it would be awesome, especially right now. Uh, so today, uh, I'm really excited to share with you as we finish up our series called This Is Us. And if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, you know that we started off the new year taking a closer look at who we are as a church. And we started with our vision because ultimately vision determines direction. Vision determines where we go. Vision has to come first. And, and ours that we have decided as a church community is simply following Jesus together. And we rested in this because we believe that if we're looking anywhere other than Jesus, if we're looking anywhere other than our Lord for direction, that we are going to eventually go the wrong way. Jesus has to be our collective focus for this life as we together, following Jesus together, respond to his invitation to follow me. So then last week, we built on this vision talking about our mission, our mission that came from the book of Matthew, the gospel, the good news of Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus issues his great commission or great community mission. And he says that we would be a community of faith, a community of those changed and transformed by the gospel, this good news, that we'd be this community of faith and we would bring faith out to our communities, to the people and places that need it the most. And I think my favorite part of last week was this, this overwhelming challenge. I think we all felt that like we saw maybe for the first time that this mission, uh, this mission of God doesn't discriminate for better or worse. It doesn't discriminate that we need to go as a church to the people and places we like and the people we feel comfortable with and the people that we vibe with, but also to the people we don't and the people that, 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 that give us pause and drive us crazy and, and to those places we'd rather not Go. Because in the end, that's where Jesus, as we follow Jesus, that's where Jesus is leading us, right? To all people, to all nations, as he seeks to save the lost. And this is us. This is us following Jesus together, partners in his work and his mission. This is 
This is us. And it's been, uh, for me, it's been, a, it's been a really cool couple weeks uh, as I've been really challenged and really encouraged and as I've been ri- reminded of all these things. Um, but today, as I said, we're going to be wrapping it up and we're going to be talking, as we close, we're going to be uh, taking a closer look at maybe something we should have started with, and that's our purpose. It's talking about our purpose, both as individuals, but also as the church. And so we're not, we're not going to be talking about the what or, or, the, or the who or the where or the how, but rather, but rather we're finally addressing this question of why. Why we're following Jesus together. Why we're a community of faith on mission with God. Why we're alive and why we're here today. And we're ending with purpose because, believe it or not, um, I, I talk with a lot of you and I talk with a lot of people in our church and in our city and our community. And the number one question that I'm asked, the number one topic of conversation that, that I have with people is that question. It's why. It's always a question of purpose. Rarely, sh- it, it's rarely uh, what should I do next or where should I go or who should I go with, but it's, it's way more about who am I and why am I here? It all comes down to purpose. It's all why because our why is the foundation in our lives for what comes next. The why is our inspired reason for living. Everything in our life builds on knowing why, and yet, if you're, if you're anything like me, you'd know that it's, it's so easy to ignore or forget our why. It's so easy to ignore or forget or exchange or confuse where, where we substitute our purpose, where we start to swap our why for maybe some of our what's, for what we do and how we do it with these uh, circumstantial details, right? And, and I think this happens, at least in my own life, because like Paul says in Romans, uh, in the day-to-day uh, grind of, of life, right, uh, and, and faith, Paul says that we often choose to trade the truth of God for a lie. Has anyone ever heard that? We often choose to trade the truth of God for a lie, the truth of God, uh, of who God says we are too, with the practical and realistic expectations from the world. That's when we start to see the world through this lens of uh, like what God did and when and how instead of why? And in the process, we, we begin to prioritize, even idolize this, this creation that was made, all of these things that were made instead of the one that made it. And then we apply that same perspective to our own identities and self-worth too. Where as long as we're still working, we're fine. As long as we're still producing, we're good. As long as we're, we're still doing, uh, as long as we keep doing and fulfilling what the world affirms as valuable, then we are A-OK. And this perspective, it can work for a while. This self-assigned purpose can work for a while. It can, but as, then as soon as something slips, and I know you've experienced this, as soon as something slips, as soon as we're laid up or laid off, as soon as we're unable to do what we thought made us, uniquely us, it leaves us feeling lost. It, it leaves us feeling like we don't matter anymore. Has anyone ever been there? I read an interesting article about professional athletes and how like they commit, right? So athletes start training in in elementary school, maybe before, and they live all of these years, all of these years, all of these years. They make it to the college level and then they make it to the professional level and they, God God willing, they have a long career in the professional, but then they retire. And, And their whole life, their identity has been built around what they could do the balls that, that they could catch in the end zone or the hoops that they could make. That's not the right way to say it. The hoops, the baskets they could make, right? <laughs> Only to have them retire and feel worthless because the things that they once did that defined them were now gone. And maybe you felt that way as a mom like, or, or as a dad where like now your kids are graduated and you're like, well, what do I do now? Who am I now? See, as soon as some of these things slip, even though this perspective can work for for sometimes years and and decades, eventually it leaves us feeling like we don't matter. So if there's there's one thing today in this foggy, cold-like state in my brain that I need you to take away and listen to for this morning, it says, I need you to know that no, no matter where you find yourself today, I need you to know that what you do 
can never define who you are. What you do, and I make no distinctions here, okay? There are no caveats. You, you, you could be a CEO. You could be an NFL linebacker and a straight-A student. You could be a prostitute or an alcoholic. You could be the rich young ruler. You could be Zacchaeus in a tree or the woman at the well. But what you do can never define who you are. Because like it or not, who you are isn't up to you. Who you are isn't up to you. And I know that makes some of you feel a little claustrophobic, especially you cuspers and you millennials. You're like, don't define me. I control my own destiny. I know where I'm going, okay? Don't tell me who I am. Well, too bad, all right? Get over yourself, your identity. And who you really are goes far deeper than your actions and your behaviors and what you think you can contribute. Your identity goes far beyond what you think you need or you want or you deserve. Who you are, who you really are, isn't up to you because your identity has already been given to you. And and we read about it, this gifting, this this identity being given to us just a moment ago in Genesis chapter 1 when God said, again, he said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created us. Male and female, he created us. We were created with identity pressed into us from God. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't even decide it. We only need to discover it. This purpose that surpasses our ability to produce. This purpose that surpasses our ability to maintain or or make the grade or catch the ball or raise your kids. It's given to us. It's given to all of us. And that means, and again, I need, you to, I need you to hear this. Take this away. Regardless of how, how long you've been in the church or how many times you've heard this from me because we talk about it a lot. I've been praying that this one phrase would sink in more than anything today. I need you to know that your life matters and it always has. And it's not about what you can do, but rather because of who God says you are. Your life matters. It always has. You were designed before the foundations of the world with dignity for a purpose, that purpose being glory, to show the world what God is really like. And we read about it in Genesis chapter 1. You were made in God's image to be like God, to, to represent God on earth in all things and do what God does so the world might know who God really is. We are the spokesmen. So the world might see God better. This is who you are, and this is why you are. This is us. We were made for glory. It's in us, woven into our souls before we were born. And there's nothing, listen this, it's who we are. And there's nothing you or I or anybody can do about it. There's nothing you or I or anybody can do about our purpose. So, What are you going to do about it? See what I did? There's nothing you can do about who you are. That ship has sailed. I'm sorry. You can try to fight it. You can try to ignore it. But in the end, you are who God says you are, whether you like it or not. So what are you going to do about it? Because we're following Jesus together in this life. We're saved by grace. We are committed to this life of following Jesus. And even though it can be hard sometimes to remember, even though it can be hard to remember, we see from the scriptures and we believe deep down that God wants to use us. We have to, that God has plans for our lives. So with that said, what are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna do with your purpose? How are you gonna live this life? knowing that you were made for more than average, that you were made in God's image to do the things that God did, how will you use your life? And as I was reflecting on that this morning, it it seems like a, a pretty wild question to ask. It almost feels inappropriate to ask it sometimes. Like when we actually start to dream about how God might use us, it somehow limits Uh, or it encroaches on the greatness of his glory. Like somehow, 
God is in danger of being one-upped or overshadowed by our finite lives. And so we never ask the question, and we never dream bigger, and we never move beyond average. But listen, I think that train of thought of misplaced reverence is just another lie, that the world is settling us and peddling us to try to keep us from ever doing anything meaningful. I sincerely believe that God wants us to approach our measly 70 to 80 years with great expectation that maybe, just maybe, we're capable of actually being who he says we are. And not just living in constant fear of who we aren't. And we see this heart from God all throughout the scriptures. From cover to cover, but specifically today we see it in the book of Colossians. Chapter 3 where where Paul says, uh, to those who have crossed beyond the basics of purpose, right? To, to this, this community of faith, bringing faith out to their city of Colossae in the first century. Paul says to them, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. And isn't that beautiful? I think most of us would typically say, let the fear and anxiety that comes from the world rule our hearts. But Paul says, allow the peace that wants to lead you from here, from this moment, from this second into eternity. Allow this peace that's already in your heart, deposited from Christ. Paul's like, allow that peace to rule your heart and your life. Verse 16, and let the message about Christ and all its richness fill and inspire your lives. Verse 17, and whatever you do or say, do it all. And this is a purpose statement if I've ever seen one. Do it all as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him through God the Father. Now check out that verse 17 one more time. And whatever you do or say, do it all as a representative of the Lord Jesus. And I just love, I hope you're seeing those dots connected because I love how Paul connects the future that God wants for us back to the beginning in the garden. As the peace that comes from Jesus living in us leads us into the future. Paul's like, do everything as you're following Jesus. Do everything from your assigned purpose of glory. Do it all as a representative for the Lord, whatever you do with this life. Do it so the world would see Jesus. And this is Genesis chapter one. Do it all for the glory of God. And there are a few quick observations as I was studying this passage connected to purpose that really stood out to me. And and I'm just going to cruise through them quick. Uh, The first one being, again, that that the purpose we've been given is universal. And it's not up to us, but how we live it out as a community of faith is individual. Our purpose is universal, but unique. Our purpose is universal, but unique. And it has to be. It has to be. This is, one of those, this is one of the main reasons that we see Adam and Eve and not just a bunch of self-replicating Adam clones, right? Because the work of representing God, the work of revealing God, this indescribable, uncontainable, un, uh, unfathomable God, the work of representing him out in the world requires way more than one personality type and way, way more than one temperament or gender or age or color. God made all of humanity, all of us, united in purpose, but unique in execution. Unique in how we fulfill this identity. And we've we've inherited it through nature and nurture. And we we all have these different passions and skills and loves and favorites and talents. and, And they all matter. They all matter because they all help make up and display a fraction, just a fraction of the sum of who God is. Our purpose is universal but unique, and we are all essential. That's point one. The number second, the second, the number second thing. Hold on. <laughs> Yesterday. Yeah. Number B. Yesterday when I was at Starbucks, I texted my wife cause I was like, we had this cold that went through the house. It wasn't the flu. So don't worry about shaking hands. But, uh, we, I was at Starbucks and, uh, and I, I had some coffee, but I also took this like over the counter Sudafed and it was like the 12 hour Sudafed. And I was like, oh, this is gonna, this is gonna be awesome. I'm gonna feel, I'm gonna breathe so well, right? And then I uh, take the Sudafed and I drink a cup of, cup of coffee and I'm like, 
I can't focus on anything. And so if this doesn't make sense, I'll tell you it later, okay? I promise. <laughs> Back to the word. Here we go. <laughs> the second thing from the text that really stood out to me was that all means all. All means all. There is very little that can't be used for God's glory in this world. There is very little that can't be used for God's glory as long as it's coming from the motivation of revealing God in the process. Paul says, in whatever you do, do it all, right? Authentically as representatives of the Lord Jesus and as you let the peace that comes from Christ rule your hearts. Paul's saying, do it all in ways only you can. And I had this great conversation on Thursday as I, with, with a new friend as I was working on the message. And it was, it was really one of those divine appointments because I was like, man, what am I going to talk about? And he was like, hey, let me tell you what I'm going through. And it's pretty much this whole message. So it's awesome. And so he's a manager at this incredible coffee shop. And he was telling me all about his passion um, and how passionate he is about coffee and pulling the perfect shot of espresso and making the best ever cappuccino and, and creating these environments that people can really experience friendship and, and growth and peace in. But then he said that he's also really passionate about ministry and telling people about Jesus and discipleship and like world missions. And, and so now he's trying to make sense as he's this manager of this amazing shop. He's trying to make sense of, of what he really should be doing with his life. And I tell you what, this tension that he's feeling it's really common. And I've been there, and I'm sure you have too, because we, we've bought into this interesting religious fallacy that the lie we exchange for truth is that glory is somehow confined to Bible study. That glory is somehow confined to praying and, and coming to church. And, and so when we read, whatever you do, do it all, we don't actually think all means all, okay? We think all uh, only, only means uh, what pastors and missionaries do when they go overseas, and this is a lie, man, and it's absolutely limiting our life. It's limiting our dreams and our expectations of how God might use us. And so let me make this clear if it's not crystal already, that whatever you do, God is saying, if you are with me, do it all for my glory, whatever it is. And this means if you love music and building guitars or shredding guitar solos up here on stage, or you love listening to vinyl, great. God wants to use your love for music so the world would know him more. If you love good food and cooking or, and baking or barbecue or whatever, there's the taste of Oshkosh right now that's happening, and, and that's amazing. God wants to use your love for food to make himself known in the world. Praise him. If you love bow hunting, Nate, if you love fishing, or hiking, or being outside in nature, or playing basketball, that'll preach, okay? That'll preach. Keep doing it. Because God wants to use your love for creation and recreation to make himself known in the world. And I, ho I hope you're catching on to this pattern, but let's take it to the next level, because sometimes I think it's easy for us to, to recognize the things we love could be used for God's glory, but what about the things we don't? So let's say you, you can't stand your job, Right? but you still have it and you can't leave it. Too bad. So sad. God wants to use your time and influence there for his glory. You get it? Wow. Let's say you got some roommates or even a spouse or maybe some kids you don't always like very much. <laughs> Guess what? Your time there, your days there, your seasons in life there isn't exempt from your purpose. God wants you to use your seasons, the good and the bad, the fascinating and uninspiring, the boring and basic, all for his glory. Because it's not always what you do. It always comes down to why. It's letting the peace that comes from your heart, the peace that comes from Christ, rule in your heart and life. And so if you like cars or writing or fashion or cutting hair or teaching kids, then do it. Come on. But do it from the heart motivation that the world would see God in it. And on the inverse, again, if, if you can't stand traffic or hipsters or skinny jeans or country USA or Christian hit radio, okay? Man, deal with it. 
Represent God in it. All means all. Without exception. All means all. And that brings us up to this last thing, this last observation, which is number three. Obviously. Observation C. Uh, beyond motivation. And not, and not con- uh, contradicting the way of Jesus, okay? Beyond your motivation and within the lines of following Jesus, the only other requirement we're given for purpose is if you're going to do it, if you're going to do something for God's glory, you better bring your best. If you're going to do it, you might as well bring your best. If you're made in God's image to do what God does, then you better not settle for average because God doesn't do things halfway. You hear me? God didn't settle for an okay creation. He said it was good. He didn't settle for an average humanity. He said it was very good. And so as we live out our divine identity, the one that's been pressed into us in creation, this has to be our standard as well. That whatever you do, do it authentically for God's glory with everything you got. With everything you got. God isn't asking you to be anyone other than you but he's calling you to be your best you for his sake. Knowing that whatever we do will never define us, but it still reflects the glory of the one that sent us. Listen, God's dream for you as one of his people, basics of humanity, but as one of his people, as his church, as the redeemed is a big one. God believes that you have something to contribute to his kingdom in his name. But to do this, you need to first remember why you're here and who you are. You aren't alive to be a passive spectator in God's redemptive plan to seek and save the lost. No, you are and always have been on God's dream team. He has been singing future and love over you before you were even born. Even before you took your first breath, God was breathing into you who he's calling you to be, to this better way to be a community of faith that would bring your faith out to the community in in, in ways that only you can. And he's gifted you with this purpose and passions and audience to take his message of hope out, as we've been learning, out so all nations might know and believe and be saved. God has been chasing you down because your life matters. God has been trying to get your attention because your life matters. We see Jesus say that he, that he would leave the 99 to hunt you down because your life matters. You've always mattered to God. So what are you going to do about it? Because you really have two options. Maybe there's three, but I see two. You can either exchange the truth for a lie believing that you are what you do and what you've done, where all of your value and your worth and your identity is situational and circumstantial to your ability to keep producing. Option number one. Or, like Tommy was saying here during offering, you can take a step of faith today and start to see that what truly defines you is independent. uh, 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 It isn't dependent on you at all. Option number two, you can cross over into a sacred sacred and accurate understanding that you are who you are because God said so. And he wants to do abundantly more than you could ever think or imagine. And not just in eternity, not to to build castles in the clouds, right? But with your actual life today. I truly believe that God is inviting you into this shift of perspective. This accurate understanding of purpose, calling you into a new life of faithfulness to live with holy expectation that maybe, just maybe, these days matter. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Band, why don't you come on up? We're just about finished. Talking about purpose. Your purpose is universal but unique. And God wants to use everything in you. All means all for his glory. And if you're going to do it, 
you might as well bring your best because in the process, you aren't just representing you or your family or your hometown. You are representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who, who formed mountains and poured oceans. We are living in that identity. So if you're gonna do it, bring your best because you're representing God in it. Now the band is gonna lead us in a tune, a, a song of contemplation, one that has been, uh, I would say, impacting and, and affecting our community in big ways. It's a new song. Um, and so it's a moment of contemplation, but also of response as you know it. Um, it's a new song that I hope helps jumpstart an even bigger conversation that we're gonna be continuing in February about who God is and who God says we are. Uh, one that we're gonna be exploring more soon. But as they lead us, even now, I'm praying, and I've been praying for you all week. I've been praying that God's letter to the Colossians would take root in your soul and that you would exchange back the lie that you have taken from the world with the truth that God says for you. That you would let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts again. That you would let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. And whatever you do or say, you would do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Your life matters to God. You were saved for a purpose. You were created for a reason. So what are you going to do about it? Let's pray. God, we believe that you love us. Even if it's unbelievable sometimes, God, we, we hold on to the truth that you are true and that you are with us and that you are leading us into something better. So God, help us, help us trade back the lie that we have bought so many times that, that our life doesn't matter or that our past makes us unqualified for your future. God, help us understand how you really see us in this moment so we can take, take massive steps of faith forward into the purpose and, and, the, and the vision and the mission that you have given us, that we can partner with you in, in, your, in your plan to seek and save the lost in ways that only we can, God. Help us see the, the passions that you've given us as opportunities for your witness. Help us see our, our, our skills and our, and our audience and the good and the bad as divine appointments for your glory. That we might say and, and, and reveal the story that you met us and how, the, and, how, and how our story can help lead others into that same place. And so God, help this just take root in our souls today. Yes, God, we love you, amen.